Book Three of the Shadow and Bone Trilogy by Lee Bardugo. Rune and Rising. Before. The monster's name was Isenrud, the Great Worm, and there were those who claimed he made the tunnels that ran beneath Ravka. Sick with appetite, he ate up silt and gravel, burrowing deeper and deeper into the earth, searching for something to satisfy his hunger, until he'd gone too far and lost himself in the dark. It was just a story, but in the White Cathedral, people were careful not to stray too far from the passages that curled around the main caverns. Strange sounds echoed through the dim warren of tunnels, groans and unexplained rumblings. Cold pockets of silence were broken by low hisses that might be nothing or might be the sinuous movement of a long body, snaking closer through a nearby passage in search of prey. In those moments, it was easy to believe that Isamrud still lived somewhere, waiting to be woken by the call of heroes, dreaming of the fine meal he would have if only some hapless child would walk into his mouth. A beast like that rests, he does not die. The boy brought the girl this tale, and others too, all the new stories he could gather in the early days when he was allowed near her. He would sit beside her bed, trying to get her to eat, listening to the pained whistle of her lungs, and he would tell her the story of a river, tamed by a powerful tide maker and trained to dive through layers of rock, seeking a magic coin. He'd whisper of poor cursed Peliakin, laboring for a thousand years with his magic pickaxe, leaving caverns and passages in his wake, a lonely creature in search of nothing but distraction, amassing golden jewels he never intended to spend. Then, one morning, the boy arrived to find his way to the girl's room barred by armed men. And when he would not leave, they dragged him from her door in chains. The priest warned the boy that faith would bring him peace and obedience would keep him breathing. Locked in her cell, alone but for the drip of water and the slow beat of her heart, the girl knew the stories of Isamrud were true. She had been swallowed whole, devoured, and in the echoing alabaster belly of the white cathedral, only the saint remained. The saint woke every day to the sound of her name being chanted, and each day her army grew its ranks swollen with the hungry and the hopeless, with wounded soldiers and children barely large enough to carry rifles. The priest told the faithful that she would be queen one day, and they believed him. But they wondered at her bruised and mysterious court, the raven-haired squalor with her sharp tongue, the ruined one with her black prayer shawl and hideous scars, the pale scholar who huddled away with his books and strange instruments. These were the sorry remnants of the second army, unfit company for a saint. Few knew that she was broken, Whatever power had blessed her, divine or otherwise, was gone, or at least out of reach. Her followers were kept at a distance so they would not see that her eyes were dark hollows, that her breath came in frightened gasps. She walked slowly, tentatively, her driftwood bones fragile in her body, the sickly girl upon whom all their hopes rested. On the surface, a new king ruled with his shadow army, and he demanded that his sun-summoner be returned. He offered threats and rewards, but the answer he received came in the form of a challenge from an outlaw the people had dubbed the Prince of the Air. He struck along the northern border, bombing supply lines, forcing the Shadow King to renew trade and travel across the fold with nothing but luck and inferny fire to keep the monsters at bay. Some said this challenger was a Lansoff prince. Some said he was a feared and rebel who refused to fight alongside witches. But all agreed he must have powers of his own. The saint rattled the bars of her new underground cage. This was her war, and she demanded freedom to fight it. The priest refused. But he'd forgotten that before she'd become a Grisha and a saint, she'd been a ghost of Kiramzin. She and the boy had hoarded secrets as Peliakin hoarded treasure. They knew how to be thieves and phantoms, how to hide strength as well as mischief. Like the teachers at the Duke's estate, the priest thought he knew the girl and what she was capable of. He was wrong. He did not hear their hidden language, did not understand the boy's resolve. He did not see the moment the girl ceased to bear her weakness as a burden and began to wear it as a guise. 